So uh, with this, I would say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, my name is Vakar Puri. I am based in Pakistan, and I'm working with Transforming Communities for Inclusion, um, TCI, um, as a senior programs officer. Uh, Transforming Communities for Inclusion is an independent global organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities, um, having its presence in more than 44 countries globally. We work with our national leaders and members to enhance their movement at the national level uh, for advocating uh, with the governments and their full inclusion in the development processes. Um, there are countries like uh, where um, uh, movement, movements of persons with psychosocial disabilities don't exist at all. And even if they do, they are uh, very medical, uh, they have a very medical perspective um, to psychosocial disability. And to counter this, our um, fellowship program has been really successful in terms of supporting the national leaders, performing their own national DPOs, and establish a momentum in the country for the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Along with this, TCI has also been supporting and providing opportunities to its members, such as um, micro grants on specific thematics, DPO support grants to support the advocacy initiatives at the national level. Uh, we do country missions uh, with our, um, um, uh, with the support of our uh, national members. We uh, do convenings um, uh, at the national level called uh, country missions and also at the sub-regional level. Um, um, to engage with a variety of stakeholders for inclusion and participation in the development process as well as in the decision-making processes. Um, I will request uh, Fiza to uh, share the uh, links of TCI website, also the contact details of uh, TCI secretariat in the chat box uh, with all of uh, the um, attendees. So if you have any questions uh, or if you want to learn more about our programs, you can um, directly write to us or visit our website. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome all of uh, the participants to this first ever webinar, which is being specifically organized on youth issues and how uh, together we can strengthen the capacity of youth with psychosocial disabilities at a global level. Um, the webinar is organized to mark the International Day of Persons with Disabilities 2022. And uh, we are doing this in partnership with International Disability Alliance and Indonesian Mental Health Association. I thank both of the organizations for partnering with us. And uh, I would now like to thank all our distinguished speakers who have joined us today and has given us their uh, precious time for sharing their experiences as youth with psychosocial disability and together to build, a common, to build on a common vision for inclusion. In this very first webinar, we will be listening to speakers from different regions um, and backgrounds. Uh, but before we begin, I would like to share with you some of the features of the webinar. I want to share that this webinar is being recorded and uh, we are recording this webinar so that we can um, share this with the larger audience afterwards. Uh, we, are we are providing uh, with the international sign interpretation and closed captions. Uh, to have access to the closed caption, please access uh, the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Um, you are requested to keep your microphones and videos off while you are not speaking. And uh, you can turn on your video and your microphone when you are invited to speak on the panel. You are also requested to speak in a normal pace so that the international sign interpreter as well as the captioner can meet the flow of the uh, presentations and statements being made by the um, um, representative speakers. Um, I will also request the interpreters to flag us if we are moving like quite fast. Um, during the event, if you have any questions for the panelists, um, you can uh, drop your questions there down in the uh, Q&A section. And, uh, uh, and we will try to respond it um, uh, over the session uh, or at the end of the session. Um, giving some background, young people with psychosocial disabilities are uh, totally left behind in majority of the aspects of their life spans and are denied, to, uh, denied equal access to health, education, social, economic, uh, political, and cultural opportunities. Um, in friend and family circles, our opinions are not at all respected as well as we are labeled as uh, mad kids and mad persons. We are not involved in any decision-making processes and not inside homes, nor the governments uh, include us in decision-making. There is a huge issue around our identity 
uh, in the society, uh, we are still tagged as persons with mental illness, mental patients, uh, persons of unsound mind, mad persons. And this confines us to the mental health legal system and takes away our legal capacity to explore opportunities, take risk, make our own decisions, and enjoy all fundamental human rights on an equal basis to others. Institutionalization on the other, on the other side, it is increasing um, massively. And there are countries where youth with psychosocial disabilities are commonly uh, found in mental asylums, rehabilitation centers, um, psych psychiatric clinics, um, they visit nursing homes and, okay, and, a, and a variety of now private care institutions is being established in many, many countries um, where they face um, a long-term confinement and isolation. Our families see us as a burden on them and we are forced to take psychiatric treatments which make us numb and weaker, not only mentally, but also physically. Psychiatric diagnosis and treatments um, make our lives worse and we are dropped out of the education systems, losing hope in the life. And there are a full list of issues which should be addressed for the inclusion of young people with psychosocial disabilities. We will now be hearing um, uh, from our speakers uh, to talk about the challenges, barriers, and issues we face in the society and what should be done by our governments to address all those issues. Uh, without taking more time, I will now request Ms. Yeni Rosa Damayanti, uh, Chair of Indonesian Mental Health Association, as well as um, one of the oldest members of TCI and uh, Vice President of TCI, to uh, give her remarks. Over to you, Yeni. You have Thank three. you, Akutar. Hello, everybody. So I'm very happy to be here and meet with you again. My name is Yeni Rosa Damayanti. I'm um, chairperson of Indonesian Mental Health Association. This is the first um, organization of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. And also I'm um, vice president of uh, TCI. Well, um, TCI and uh, my organization, IMHA, Indonesian Mental Health Association, and AIDA together, we conducted a post-GDS workshop in October 3rd and 4th to review the commitments of Nepal, Pakistan, Indonesia. And for Indonesia, this is the first time our government sent their commitment to uh, GDS. On the second day, we invited a big group of youth with dis uh, psychosocial disabilities from, all of, from Indonesia to be part of the youth workshop to specifically talk about the situations of youth with disabilities. This is um, quite, I mean, uh, this is a moment that quite um, a happy moment for us because this is the first time TCI conducted this particular discussion on youth with disability um, in one, you know, one formal setting. During the workshop, the youth call for action was discussed and how we as TCI movement can support the youth movement of person with psychosocial disabilities. As mentioned by Wakar before, youth with disabilities face tremendous challenges in education institutions in which they are misunderstood, bullied, and dropped out of school. So many of um, young people with psychosocial disabilities drop out of school, especially the higher education. Even in the field of work, we have difficulties finding work, have to hide our condition while working, terminated from work when they are when, when the employer find out that we have this condition. And we cannot even demand reasonable accommodation because we cannot you know, um, open up about our uh, psychosocial disabilities. Not to mention bullying and insult from the neighborhood, from people in our village and the society where we live. Many of young people with disabilities have also been shackled from a young age and placed in mental institutions. The idea of setting up a youth group came during that workshop that um, uh, uh, one of the participants, who also now is one of the speakers, asked that, can we have a TCI youth platform? And uh, of course, this question, uh, we are very happy uh, to respond, and we are very happy to support a youth platform as a, as, a, as a forum in which youth with psychosocial disabilities can, you know, can express themselves and also can find solution of the problem that we face. 
um, yeah, very happy to support this uh, initiative. And uh, us from IMHA as key partners from the beginning are very happy to be part of this process. Um, on behalf of PCI, we also would like to thank Ida for supporting the workshop and working together with us. This, this is going to be a very good beginning for all of us to together uh, thinking about challenges faced with young people with psychosocial disabilities and you know, um, um, with programs and real action can find solutions of the face that um, uh, of, of the problem that they face. Uh, I met, uh, Indonesian Mental Health Association is one of the oldest member of TCI. We uh, started um, um, be part of TCI right from the beginning. And um, we are one of the founding member, member of TCI. Um, in Indonesia, IMHA is uh, one, um, one quite uh, influential organization of persons with disabilities. And we have advocated with our government for full inclusion of persons with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. We have several programs, including peer support. We have research and, of course, advocacy as the heart of the work of IMHA. Um, so I would like to uh, say thank you you very much for all of the attendees of this uh, uh, webinar and uh, uh, yeah I mean the, hopefully we can have a very meaningful and fruitful discussion thank you very much back to you Waka thank you Yeni um, thank you so much for your uh, remarks and yes definitely this is uh, uh, this this webinar is being organized for this purpose only that we will be drawing out our um, key learnings from uh, the uh, the sharings which people will do so we will not be doing only one webinar but we will be organizing uh, two three webinars to develop on what we need to do for uh, the young people with psychosocial disabilities and, uh, and 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 your immense work with the government of indonesia and cross disability stakeholders is commendable and praiseworthy and I think it is the best practices. Uh, this best practice, like your organization, is um, is uh, it can be uh, an a learning for the emerging DPOs to learn how to make relations, how to advocate with the government, and how to engage with different key stakeholders to advocate at the national level. Thank you so much, um, Jenny. Um, and I would now request one of the other one more founding members of TCI. Uh, Ms. Sarah Osborne uh, from PSA, Psychiatric Survivors Association, to take the floor. Um, Sarah identifies as a woman with a psychosocial disability and is a young leader from Fiji. Um, um, she has been associated with Psychiatric Survivors Association, um, one of the oldest survivor movement from Pacific since 2013. Sarah will share uh, with us about the leadership situation in Pacific and what to do to correct the power imbalances and strengthen the movement of youth with psychosocial disabilities in, in the Pacific and uh, how to provide leadership opportunities to young people with psychosocial disabilities in the Pacific region. Um, over to you, um, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akar. Thank you, Mulavinaka, to everyone from uh, Fiji. Uh, uh, yes, my name is Sarah Osborne and uh, I identify as a person with psychosocial disability uh, and I have been with the Psychiatric Survivors Association uh, for the past eight years, will be nine years in March next year. Um, thank you for giving the opportunity to the organizers, to the uh, funders who are supporting this uh, uh, webinar. It's a great uh, opportunity and uh, I must thank uh, TCIA for bringing up this platform as uh, uh, with us here in the Pacific, we do not have a youth movement or psycho youth uh, psychosocial disability movement. Uh, here in Fiji and the Pacific Islands, we, most of these islands and even Fiji, we are influenced by our culture and religion. Um, and this is a great reason uh, why the implementation and the recognition of CRPD is taking a long time uh, for it to be implemented and be recognized in the Pacific. Yeah? Uh, it is uh, the Pacific is still very much a medical model, and um, the people of the Pacific, the youths of the Pacific, uh, as, as as I speak from my experience, we 
uh, we have been dependent on this for a long time. And, and uh, our right to choose has been violated because this is the only option that we have here in Fiji and in the Pacific. And, and because of this only option we have, um, most of us have developed uh, more chronic illnesses as well as uh, acquiring other disability due to the side effects of the medication. And uh, persons with psychosocial, youths with the psychosocial disability, they become uh, uh, victims of abuse in the, in the hands of law enforcers, in the hands of uh, um, uh, medical uh, uh, officers. You know, they, they, they face different types of abuse and yet they their voice, uh, they, they are not confident to speak out. They are not confident to identify as a person uh, with psychosocial disability in, in, in the Pacific. Um, and also um, with our, because we have, uh, because we only have the medical model, we are treated like uh, criminals and prisoners. I was visiting the, our psychiatric uh, institution um, I think last two months, and I saw that uh, our beds, we have uh, uh, contract-based beds, and, and we, we are caged, you know, like uh, persons with psychosocial disability, especially the youths, they are kept in cages, uh, cage-like uh, rooms where they have uh, uh, iron doors, concrete beds, and even some of them, even the mattresses, you sit on their mattresses, it's like only a few inch, and can only imagine what they go through at night. Um, so my question, like I just, I have a few questions because our, our gatekeepers, our, uh, uh, the people who are in charge of making the laws in our islands, in our countries, they are influenced more about, by culture and religion. How can we as TCI movements, you know, I was thinking, yes, I'm grateful TCI is pushing forward for human rights model and helping us to move away from medical model. You know, but for us here in the Pacific, it, it's, it is a dream, you know, it is a dream for us and we are advocating at the same time, you know, we are advocating for changes to happen for us to, for our rights to be recognized, for us to be seen as human beings and not be treated as some sort of mad people or some, some sort of, uh, um, you know, criminals, you know, like how can we also work together as, uh, as uh, this movement to ensure that people or member or youths who choose medical model you know how can we also ensure that even though they choose medical model how can we ensure that uh, you know their their needs are accommodated you know and also for us one of the major problems here for youths not being able uh, for us not having any organizations for youth movements or for persons with social disability or having youths um to be leaders you know in, in the Pacific is because of the stigma. Stigma is still a huge problem for us here. Stigma that is associated with mental illness. You know, it stigmatizes persons with psychosocial disability, especially youth. You know, they drop out from school, they lose their scholarships, uh, they cannot get proper employment. And yes, as, as mentioned by um, uh, Yeni, reasonable accommodation is not provided in the educational uh, setting, as well as uh, uh, you name it, in the other thematic areas, whether it's access to justice, or employment is the same problem. Also for us, you know, a way forward is for us to continue to raise awareness. We need to uh, be more active. We need more support from organizations like TCIA to train us, you know, not to target cross disability movements, but specifically build up the capacity of organizations like PSA that we may be well, be well equipped in terms of understanding the CRPD that we are able you know, to go out there into the communities and raise awareness and educate our youths that it is not, you know, it, there's no shame to identify as a person with psychosocial disability. It does not decrease, you know, your self-worth or who you are. It does not rob you of your identity as a son, as, you know, as a Itoke, as a Fijian or as a Tongan, but rather, you know, help us uh, to build that confidence and that resilience in us for us to be able to voice um, the, the challenges that we, we face. In our communities, we are, not, we are not allowed to make decisions. We are not part of anything as we speak right now. That is the experience persons, uh, youths with psychosocial disability here in Fiji are going through. Even in our cross-disability movement, we feel that we're still left behind. We feel that when we're sitting in a table filled with cross-disability um, uh, members, you know, like we 
um, we are left behind in terms of discussion and, and they do not want to delegate tasks to us thinking that we may fail, that we are not able to carry out the task. Um, also resources, uh, resources in terms of finance, uh, financial support is much needed in this area because we have to travel out. And yes, we have a cross disability movement that's already supporting um, uh, other small uh, neighboring islands, but we need TCIA, PSA working together to support these islands because we have been established since 2004 and TCIA has more, much more experience and therefore, you know, requesting uh, if you're listening donors uh, that are supporting TCIA, PSA, even I as a person with psychosocial disability, I am confident now because I have the support of TCIA. Always, you know, always a phone call away, always, always, always a message away. More awareness, like I, I, I mentioned, needs to be done. I mean, it, it not only needs to be done uh, uh, off, it needs to be continuous. You know, it, need, it needs to take place at the government level with law enforcers, other relevant ministries, including nursing colleges, because like I mentioned, we, it will take some time for us to turn from medical to medical model to human rights based model. But and then, you know, it pains me because while we are advocating for that change to happen, people with the psychosocial disability here, youth with the psychosocial disability here, the only option we have is medical. Now, how can we at the same time advocate for this change and at the same time, you know, come up with some sort of standard to improve? The, the services that is uh, being provided by these health uh, services, health uh, providers, uh, you know, so that our members do not have to suffer because, you know, like I mentioned, we are influenced by our cultures, by our religion, the belief system that we have here. And also um, access to education as mentioned by Yeni earlier on, we, we have a lack of access to that. Most of the youths in Fiji are not are really that educated. Some of them are educated, but they cannot find proper employment because of the stigma that is associated with mental illness. They lose their scholarship, um, reasonable accommodations not provided. And similarly to employment, uh, for us here in the Pacific, once you have a mental illness, it is really tough, you know, it is really tough uh, for you to find proper, and uh, proper, uh, you know, proper employment. We also need more capacity building to advocate, yes, PSA, exists, but capacity building is needed in terms of how to advocate. We learn based from the experience we face on a daily basis. And you know, if we can continue to, to, to depend on the experiences that we, we face every day and then we sit back and say, okay, we did that wrong, we will have to correct this. If that continues, you know, you can only imagine the amount of time we'll be wasting. Um, therefore requesting um, uh, big movements like the CIA again, Please build our capacity, teach us, help us understand our rights, help us, uh, you know, um, understand how to work with youth. Maybe we can change it into our context, vice versa. And then also um, uh, uh, help us with um, uh, securing uh, financial support, you know. Right now, as we speak, there's only two people here in our office and yet we're still working we're not complaining we are passionate with the work that we do but these Sarah, are some of the areas like in terms of leadership yeah Sarah, you Thank need to you. slow down I... <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry um so where, which part do you want me to repeat or uh, i think just the I, last because bit. i have come to the end of my presentation yeah just, just the last bit if you can repeat um because the captioner didn't get it Okay, okay, so I mentioned like um, advocacy, yeah? I'm pleading with uh, TCIA, like even though PSA exists, we, we learn from uh, like our experience on a day to day basis, like something happens, we go and address it and then we come back and then we, we reflect again, okay, this worked, this did not work and then we note it down and then the next situation comes up and then we apply it over there. So like I'm, I'm, I'm pleading with TCIA, Indonesia, like, I've, I've been, uh, been part of this movement for a while and I've seen how much experienced you are. Please help PSA advocate, um, you know, to develop uh, advocacy toolkits to secure funding. Um, and also, like I mentioned, my main message today is like, we cannot leave members who choose medical model behind and continue to advocate. Okay, please, um, because in the Pacific, this is the only option we have. 
I know we are trying to move to medical uh, human rights model, but it will take time for us. It will not take, you know, overnight because we in our culture, we respect our elders. They make the decisions. And in our countries, the government, like the law, the lawmakers, they are influenced by our cultures and our belief system. Hence the reason why, how can we work together, uh, uh, support PSA to advocate for this change. And at the same time, also let's accommodate, uh, you know, the needs and also uh, help improve the medical model so that members who choose medical model, their rights are not violated. And also they do not become, um, you know, uh, more traumatized or, or more sick or what, um, you know, make things, make life worse for them with the current system that we have. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it was, uh, thank you so much for sharing the, uh, all of the points and the, the points which you have mentioned, like they're super valid. And uh, this is why we organized this youth webinar so that uh, we can learn from the uh, different countries, our members in different regions, in different countries, that what needs to be done, uh, 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 where TCI can support and how we can uh, build a, for a stronger youth movement in different countries, in different regions. You rightly said uh, the side effects of medications. Uh, and then uh, you also mentioned about the institutionalization where um, there is now a DEI guideline which, um, which which should come up and and the OPDs and DPOs should be prepared and trained at the national level uh, to, to work for deinstitutionalization in different countries. As CRPD, it opens the doors uh, um, uh, for different opportunities to having access to employment, education, uh, social protection, community services, and, and how important it is. You also mentioned about some uh, grassroots initiatives and um, um, about the paradigm shift and how we can, you know, uh, aware the, um, uh, the, the community uh, on the human rights perspective. And definitely it's going to take time. And um, there is, I think there is a lot of need of uh, working at the grassroots level uh, to aware the community on the uh, on the human rights based perspective and psychosocial disability. So these points are very well noted um, at our end, um, uh, Sarah. And thanks a lot for your uh, intervention. Um, as we know that young women and girls with psychosocial disabilities face a number of challenges and are doubly discriminated in our societies. Young girls with psychosocial disabilities are confined inside homes due to cultural barriers and are not encouraged to excel more in the lives um, on an equal basis to others. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, to speak about the uh, issues of young girls with psychosocial disabilities and having no access to justice, I will now invite Ms. Hawa Ojefo from Nigeria. Hawa, is, um, um, Hawa identifies as a, a woman with psychosocial disability and she's the executive director of She Rights Women um, and popularly tagged as the voice and face of uh, people with psychosocial disabilities in Nigeria. Over to you, uh, Hawa. Thank you so much, Walker. Um, my audio great? Yes. All right, thank you so much for having me. Yes, indeed. Um, we are, my name is Hawa Ojefo. I am definitely uh, a woman with a psychosocial disability. I have identified publicly for a while now. And um, indeed, there are, there are um, nuances in terms of discrimination that women with psychosocial disabilities and even broadly women with disabilities are subject to a lot of violence and injustice. So as a woman with a psychosocial disability, I can tell you firsthand that there are layers to the discrimination of women with disabilities. You know, first off, we can look at, oh, um, a woman with um, just a, a disability. And then we can look at a woman with a psychosocial disability. And then we can say a woman with a psychosocial disability who visibly represents a social, cultural, or religious group. And I could go on and on, but I'm sure you understand. So there are nuances within the disability group, but also within the psychosocial disability groups as well, that we must take into consideration when we're looking at discrimination, violence, and injustices towards young women with psychosocial disabilities. 
And in my experience as the leader of uh, my organization, She Writes Woman, um, we're a movement that gives mental health a voice in Nigeria by empowering people you know, with lived experience to tell their own stories, co-create the solutions and advocate for their rights. And so women with psychosocial disabilities are disproportionately affected by injustices, discrimination and violence. And where are some of these things coming from? First, it's important to understand where they're coming from in order for us to see how to begin to change the systems. First off, cultural and, and religious beliefs. We are a very religious people. So there is underlying stigma. There are archaic beliefs and practices that ostracize, inflict harms like cutting evil spirits out of women and secluding them, isolating them, sometimes even in government facilities and other state institutions to keep them away from society. You're stripping them of their rights. They're also stripping them from access to the highest quality, um, highest possible quality of care. Um, there are normative um, you know, barriers as well. So when we talk about mental issues being interpreted as incomplete stories, I like to say, you know, when you use two separate sentences to say, for example, how one leaves with bipolar, and then something happens and you say, oh, how are, um, you know, maybe um, threatened, I don't know, her mother or something. And then it becomes, somebody hears those two things and says, oh, how one leaves with a bipolar condition, and so she threatened her mother. And so we have these incomplete stories that are feeding off very old narratives where we need to plug those gaps to begin to retell those stories. And in these stories, we're painting women with psychosocial disabilities as inherently violent, unable to be wives, unable to be mothers, unable to be co-workers, and just as people who are safe to be in the community on an equal basis of every other person. But what could really help? I believe, first off, we must dismantle patriarchal systems, you know, systems, um, you know, justice, social cultural systems that see women with mental health conditions as less than, you know, systems that despite disability laws of um, equality, you know, this system still perpetuates and strip us of um, agency and strip us of, you know, our capacity, you know, whether it's the legal capacity or the social capacity, whether to be trustworthy or, you know, to be able to testify and things like that. The second thing that I would like to draw attention to is sexual violence. In my organization, as a rights woman, we have recorded that seven in 10 women who have made contact with us have experienced some level of sexual violence at least once in their lifetime. And that's such a huge number. So it is impossible to understand the realities of justice and discrimination of women with psychosocial disabilities without really addressing our vulnerabilities to sexual violence. So a lot of times you'd say, oh, you know, perhaps it's, you know, it's her fault. She did X, Y, Z. You know, you see that blame and shame still going on with it. Meanwhile, it is our condition and disability that causes us to be vulnerable, causes the society to look at women with psychosocial disabilities as easy prey to get away with certain kinds of social issues like sexual abuse. Um, and I think the last bit is a bit more nuanced. It's a bit more covert, you know, and it is covert abuse um, with regards to, as, as a weapon in violence against women, or women with psychosocial disabilities. There's a lot of focus on the physical aspects of abuse and injustices and discrimination, even in the workplaces and things like that. But there is less focus on the emotional and psychological damage that it does to women already living with psychosocial disabilities. You know, so we see a lot of times that their conditions are deliberately weaponized to discredit them. You know, so I've experienced it firsthand where, you know, where an issue, an issue where I was completely stable. I am, I have been working um, at full capacity, perhaps doing better than most, um, proudly. Um, but a situation where it was just very easy for the perpetrator to try to weaponize my mental health condition in order to discredit me, you know, to go around to other victims who also, women in particular, who live with mental health conditions, to gaslight and manipulate them, to make them question their reality in order to keep them silent. We also see the use of spiritual abuse, where we weaponize religion and spiritual um, um, texts to keep people secluded, isolated, to keep them in abusive situations, and to disempower them 
we see situations, and I've experienced first time, smear campaigns to further break off people with psychosocial, women with psychosocial disabilities from community belonging and connections in places and spaces they have built trust. Now, when we understand that, it's important for us to then look at how do we undo that? Because we need to understand where the problem is really coming from, the roots of the problem. There are so many things we've seen on the surface, but when we really problem solve, we get to the bottom of it. These are certain issues that we see. And what can be done is, number one, we need to really uh, overhaul our justice system. You know, uh, women-centered justice reform is beneficial for all people because currently it is not women-friendly and it's definitely not sensitive to the needs and the sensitivities of women with psychosocial disabilities. You go through a system where you're constantly questioned, where your reality is questioned, where your um, experiences are, are you know, are disregarded because you're a woman with a psychosocial dis um, with a psychosocial disability. We see it not just in the justice reform, but in workplaces, in school environments, in organizations, and even a social media internet where you're just being open about your mental health condition or the psychosocial disability, which by the way does a lot of good, you know, still could be a, a weapon used against you. And so we need to start overhauling and looking at sensitivities to inject back into the system that center the, the people that are most vulnerable within the system, the people who are likely to get excluded from the system. The second thing I will talk about is anti-women practices and procedures or, you know, beliefs that are within the system, whether it is from cultural beliefs, whether it, there's a lot of work I have to say that needs to be done on the cultural aspect as well. Because sometimes, and especially in countries like ours, it's not enough to just make laws. We must go down to the grassroots and begin to undo certain beliefs that have been embedded for generations, certain cultural practices that have been perpetuated, things that people hold dearest to their hearts, whether it's from religious practices, just the culture. We must sit with these leaders to begin to interrogate, but not just interrogating it, because we see that it is disproportionate. It affects a certain group of women with psychosocial disabilities without affecting other groups. You know, we look at privilege, we look at exposure, we look at orientation, we look at your level of education, we look at your access to justice as well. So in order for us to do all of these things, to overhaul and protect women with psychosocial disabilities in their access to justice, we must first begin not just trying to like get them through the door, because when they get through the door, they still have to deal with the systems that are anti-women and anti-women with psychosocial disabilities. We must overhaul our justice systems. We must begin to push, you know, ministries, um, departments, agencies, commissions that are in charge of disabilities to begin to pull in women with psychosocial disabilities. Because a lot of times we are furthest behind, we, even within the disability community, that there is a lot about disabilities. But when it comes to psychosocial disabilities, even the disability community looks at you like, are you sure that's really something? Are you sure you're not the one overthinking it? Are you sure, again, that same limited um, knowledge and information being used against us to discredit us, to question the validity of our experience as women with psychosocial disabilities, and there, you know, even hindering us from reforming a system that actually caters to the most vulnerable people. So I hope that sort of gives an idea of where we are at and how we can begin to access justice and end violence all types of violence, not just the violence that is visible to the human eye, but violence that is also very implicit, violence that is covert, viol violence that is very psychological and emotional, violence that we don't always see the effect until years down the line, but violence that can absolutely be disastrous to the very fabric of the society. So thank you so much for having me. I, I do hope that I've contributed immensely. Awa, thank you so much for your um wonderful submission and how we can um, include uh, women with psychosocial disabilities um, in the development process. You rightly said it's same situation in, in my country where I am situated. The cultural barriers and the re religious barriers, these are, um, for example, if a woman with psychosocial disability is raped and she, is, she cannot go and report anywhere because there are the cultural barriers and, and the uh, uh, the religious barriers, they are so much imposed and um, and 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 the, 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 the cases remain unreported. And the number which you have shared with us that seven out of 10 women with sex, social disabilities are, um, are subject to sub uh, sexual violence, which is a huge number and, and we should be addressing this. Um, and one of the solutions which you mentioned, like working with the cross, uh, I would just add into uh, the, 
the stakeholder part, which you mentioned that we need to work with the ministries and we need to work within the uh, access to justice system. And I think there is also need to bring in the cross disability stakeholders and work together with the ministries uh, for um, for the uh, um, for having access to justice and not only access to justice but also the other um, uh, other opportunities which women with psychosocial disability are unable to uh, access in the society so thank you so much for making your submission and the uh, all of your suggestions are well taken with us um so yeah um Recently, TCI uh, mobilized with its members in um, East Africa and completed one uh, sub-regional meeting in Addis Ababa and um, the other, we did two country missions, in, one in Uganda and one in Kenya. So in Kenya, we witnessed that most of the participants who were with us in the room were uh, young people and have, and, and were um, institutionalized in some of, uh, like uh, some time back. And I would now request Brian, uh, uh, Brian Emanuel from the Stronger Project Kenya uh, to take uh, to next take the floor and share with us the stories of youth with psychosocial disabilities from Kenya and uh, specifically how it has affected how the institutionalization has affected their lives. Uh, Brian is a young Kenyan with a psychosocial disability. Brian is also a founding uh, a founder of the Stronger Project uh, in 2017. Um, um, and uh, it's an advocacy uh, platform for young people with psychosocial disabilities in Kenya. Over to you, Brian. Okay, thank you so much, Waka. Uh, thank you so much, Waka. <clears throat> and today is a, it's a really cool morning here in Kenya. And I'm a bit under the weather, but I'll do my best to, 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 to give my, my submissions to, to this uh, webinar today. And as Waka uh, mentioned, I'm a young person with a psychosocial disability, and I'm passionate about uh, psychosocial disability rights advocacy, as well as mental health awareness. And today I'm going to be giving a perspective of uh, the institutionalization and, and psychiatry uh, of pers a young persons with psychosocial disabilities. So, uh, for from our from our perspective uh, or from the experiences uh, personally had and other young people that have been able to interact with, uh, there are uh, there are so many so many uh, issues that come with uh, institutionalization of uh, of young persons with uh, psychosocial disabilities or being uh, committed to psychiatric help. And you find that uh, most of, most of the time, uh, these young people don't have a chance to really to really even make decisions on their own when it comes to uh, what they really need in terms of what kind of help do they think that uh, could really be of great as, uh, support to them. And from from some of the uh, data that we have, like for example, from the Kenya National Commission of Human Rights. They estimated that 25% uh, to 40% of, of outpatients and inpatient inpatients were actually people who are uh, experiencing mental health uh, problems. And when you go on ground, you actually you realize that most of these are young people who have been taken there either by the, mostly by their family members or some members of their community because they feel that this person. Uh, uh, the best place he, can, he or she can get the help is by uh, is by being committed to a to a to a to a mental mental institution or a psychiatric uh, ward in a hospital. And this is this is mostly propagated by uh, the fear uh, of being stigma uh, stigmatized by society. Also, the family doesn't want to be discriminated against uh, by their society because they have a son or a daughter who has a mental illness. Again, we have so many cultural and uh, looking at the cultural background, it greatly affects how people uh, perceive mental illness in, in our communities. And this actually pushes the parents or the caregivers to commit their young people to, to mental health institutions. And when this happens, uh, 
most of the time they are they are coerced into it rather than having a chance to uh, look into it and see do I really need this or is there another kind of intervention that can really help me uh, cope with um, the mental illness that I that I experience. So uh, that, that's one thing, uh, coercion, that's where coercion really comes in. And that also affects uh, their right to legal capacity. And when some of them even go to those institutions, uh, they've expressed or rather shared stories where it actually shows that they, they experience some amount of neglect. Others have experienced physical and also verbal abuse. And the, 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 the most challenging part is even after they are out of uh, these institutions, uh, there are no clear strategies in place to really support how these young people get reintegrated back into society. And that's a really huge gap because uh, this person uh, has been exposed to a different environment uh, on heavy medication. This person can't really, uh, just go back into society. They, they view the, 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 you literally view the world differently after you're out of uh, uh, an institution. And this uh, again affects how you interact with the environment uh, and new barriers start arising. And you find that you can't really participate on an equal basis with other people as it was expected because uh, they took you there uh, expecting that you're going to heal from uh, your disability. And instead of giving you the supports that you needed for you to be able to thrive in your society with your disability without making uh, you feel like you're, you're such, a, such a burden that we need to take you away from us so that you can get the help you, you need and then you can bring you back when you're okay. And this worsens our well being. And the whole thing about this deinstitutionalization, it's still, uh, I would say it's, it's still a, a new concept to most people, even when you try to, to talk about it or bring up the topic. And most people find it uh, complex. And I would say it's a bit complex when you don't have a, a full uh, ex exposure to the whole concept. Uh, but one thing I know, it's something that will, it's progressive. And we've actually seen many countries uh, failing to really progress in this and even being able to consolidate this whole concept. And this is where uh, we persons with lived experience or lived experience uh, leaders, as advocates, this is where we step in where we can be able to inform the public, being able to inform decision makers about what are the most appropriate uh, strategies and changes in mental health uh, policies that can play a, a role in, in making the institutionalization a reality and putting in place community-based uh, mental health care that will help us thrive more in our communities. And even us young people even realizing our dreams, realizing our potential and even feeling more included in our society instead of being isolated into a place where it's a sin for <laughs> mad people, as it's usually said. So, and also, and, and when it comes also to, to the whole concept of tell, uh, when you come and tell people that, uh, yeah, we really need to reduce uh, the, the population size of these uh, institutions, they feel that it is going, it, it's going to work against the whole uh, concept of mental health care. But they don't realize that, yeah, that will be reduced, but we're going to increase more community engagement where uh, community-based uh, mental health care. And this is going to reduce a lot of uh, dependence uh, on institutions, on medication. It is going to reduce uh, isolation, something that you feel immediately you're taken into an institution. And also other consequences that make it quite difficult for persons with lived experience or psychosocial disabilities to, to adjust after coming out of an institution. I might also want to add that uh, when it comes to supporting uh, support for persons with psychosocial disabilities, it's quite, 
I would say it's it's still insufficient because the whole concept of psychosocial disabilities hasn't hasn't been clearly grasped. Though I can see there are a lot of uh, advocates out there who are really trying to push this new uh, concept that moves from the medical model to the to the human rights model. So there's still some uh, let's say you can say it's uh, it's still insufficiently understood. Uh, there is information, but uh, people are really not digesting that information. Again, because the challenge is uh, when you talk about a psychosocial disability, the moment uh, you just mentioned the term disability, people expect either to see uh, a physical disability that they can really look at and say, yes, this person has a disability. So the concept of psychosocial disabilities and other invisible disabilities is actually a challenge that you have. And we also need more information when it comes to the types of mental health problems and how can we support an individual without necessarily taking them to an institution? How can we support them? What kind of appropriate and meaningful support systems can we place for this individual? And I've seen that work for me. For example, today morning, I woke up feeling really awful. I had no motivation, but because I have a support person, that person has been able to support me all through and make sure I've set up and I'm here with you on this webinar. So that's a really good example of what uh, support does. It helps you uh, participate. It helps you uh, contribute to even contentious issues like the ones that you are discussing about today. So support is a really important thing when it comes to persons with psychosocial disabilities being included in their society. So the other thing I would say that uh, to ensure independent living and community integration, we need to have comprehensive and intersectional approaches that are locally relevant, but participatory and based on the CRPD. The reason why I've said they need to be approaches that are locally relevant, we have good practices out there, let's say from countries like Australia, there's a country like Canada, they have really good practices when it comes to supporting persons with psychosocial disabilities and inclusion. So instead of just taking those practices and literally putting them into, into on the table and saying, yeah, this is what we're gonna do. You can just take that into context. Uh, uh, how does it work for people in Kenya? Or how does it work for people in Zambia? How does it work for people in Uganda or Nigeria? How does it work? How do we put it into context so that can be able to actualize those practices, but within the context of the environment or the communities that will, will benefit from it. And that's all I have for now. And I hope I've been able to, to highlight some of the things. I had five minutes and I hope I've utilized those minutes properly. So I'm going to hand over back to Wakar. Thank you so much for listening and being patient with me. Thank you so much, uh, Brian, uh, for making your submission and uh, sharing the points. Uh, um, your points are well taken, again, um, as we did for others. And uh, the point which you've mentioned about the families, I think it's, it's very important to raise awareness in the families and the communities because they take us to the uh, psychiatric uh, institutions and uh, psychiatric facilities and, and they don't ask us like what we need, but they tell us that what you need, you, you need to take psychiatric medications and those high dose psychiatric medications, then, um, you know, they, uh, they, they affect our physical strength. And, um, and when a person with psychosocial disability has lived in a psychiatric institution for a very long time, and when he um, exits the institution, he has a very, very less strength left with uh, left with him and as you said about the di uh, uh, di webinar uh, di um, guidelines also um, yes definitely there is a need to work with the stakeholders at the national level through the uh, national leaders um, and and first having the knowledge of um, the di 
guidelines, like how we can implement the DI guidelines in different countries, and uh, um, and also how the um, national leaders can work at the national level for uh, implementation of the DI guidelines. Um, thank you for sharing those as well. And um, and as, as you mentioned about the best practices, I will leave you to uh, Yeni Rosa sometime afterwards. How IMHA has been uh, engaging. Uh, all of the stakeholders and uh, awareing, uh, raising awareness about psychosocial disability in the community and uh, working with different stakeholders. Um, and um, definitely, uh, we all are also learning from uh, Yeni Rosa, uh, how they have done that at the national level, how they engage with the governments, how they engage at the community. So uh, we will take note of this as well. And uh, now we'll move to the next speaker. Um, young people are dropped out of the education systems and psychiatric diagnosis and treatments is forced upon us. As Brian said, we are, um, we are, we are, uh, we are um, known as uh, um, slow learners, autistic people. Um, and, and rather than asking us what support we need uh, and uh, to be educated, they tell us like, um, they force like uh, what you need. So um, uh, for this, I have in, I will in now invite Mazida from IMHA. Mazida is a recent graduate which focuses on psychosocial disability policy as her research area as well. And as part of IMHA, she is actively contributing to the voice of young people with psychosocial disabilities in Indonesia. Um, Mazida, over to you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, hello everyone, it's really nice to uh, be here with all of you. I'm Masjida from Indonesia, and I would like to talk about the um, youth with disability in educational uh, process. Uh, so let's just start it. Um, I would like to highlight that education for all youth is critical for realize, realizing their full potential. Youth with disabilities are among the most marginalized and poorest of the world's youth population and are more likely to face severe social, economic, and civic disparities uh, compared to those without disabilities, even in developed country, uh, countries. So uh, for many young people with disabilities, uh, exclusion, isolation, and abuse, as well as lack of education and upper economic opportunities are um, daily experiences. Um, we have so uh, many youth uh, as a global population uh, estimates uh, suggest that there are between uh, 180 and 2020 million youth with disabilities. Uh, worldwide and nearly 80% of them live in developing countries uh, such as Indonesia um, which, uh, which also developing countries and then um, it reflects that uh, there is insufficient uh, data on youth with disabilities especially in developed world. Youth with disabilities have a lower probability of entering, staying or even advancing in an educational institution than youth without disabilities. Uh, so I would like to uh, highlight the four barriers um, on, on youth with disabilities during their time entering the educational process, which usually makes them uh, drop out from school. Uh, the first one is that educational establishments are often inaccessible. It lacks of appropriate facilities or do not provide the accommodation or assistive devices necessary for uh, their inclusion and academic success. This leads to youth with disabilities running a high risk of being illiterate, leading to uh, restricted opportunities for further education and employment. And then uh, number two, uh, the, uh, it lacks of uh, training, sensitization, awareness raising, capacity building programs, and special education training designed to adequately prepare teachers and educators. Uh, you know, without proper training, teachers tend to lack of understanding the needs of youth with disabilities in educational institutions. Uh, number three, uh, on the other side, some families uh, do not feel that youth with disabilities should receive an education. So they often believe that young people with disabilities are incapable of learning. In many societies that uh, favor males, young women with disabilities are further disadvantaged as families may be reluctant to allocate resources to them. And uh, the last one is that um, 
special and segregated education system may be um, below par with mainstream education, isolates students with disability and may not lead uh, to holistic learning. Um, it deprives students with and without disabilities of interaction with each other, which would be uh, actually it would be a rich learning experience that could advance greater acceptance and normalizing and mainstreaming uh, visibility in society. So, with this uh, different education system, um, many youth with disability like us, um, we could pull it because for them it's it's not normal because you know um, Indonesia and as, as an as an example there is a uh, a special school for those with the disabilities. So um, uh, that's a, one of the biggest issues uh, that we face uh, right now, uh, not only in Indonesia, I'm sure, but in other countries. Uh, so what are we going to, to do with that? And what are we need? What, are we, uh, what is the situation to access quality education on equal basis to others? Um, for me, I think, uh, the first one is that build inclusive and accessible schools are the essential condition to promote social inclusion. Uh, because, you know, uh, acceptance, equality and opportunities, opportunities in school that are equal, even in college for individuals with disabilities, um, is the basic need, uh, that we really want to have when we enter the educational system, either in school or in uh, college. Uh, just as an example, uh, they provide a room for, for a student who needs to take a rest, including uh, the staff that has been trained to assist the student with a psychosocial disability. So I have an experience uh, during my, uh, my study uh, in, uh, here in Bogor, in Indonesia. So um, I'm, I'm so lucky at that time because I got uh, what I need. Uh, when I want to take a rest, because um, sometimes uh, I have a bipolar and sometimes it's just um, the mood swing uh, suddenly uh, drop and I have to take a rest. Uh, and I ask to the uh, professor and they be like, okay, Masida, uh, you can go take a rest and um, uh, to, uh, take your time uh, as you need, something like that. And even during in the class, when I don't have any mood to learn, uh, but I want to, I want to do, uh, I want to listen the the uh, the learning of that day. I will ask uh, the the professor like, uh, can I do this and that uh, while uh, listening to your uh, lesson? But I promise that I will not disturb the others. Uh, as an example, I just need to study with uh, uh, with uh, listening music. Uh, just an example, um, which I, I realized that. Uh, not all of students uh, in in many um, private or public college in Indonesia has uh, has haven't practiced that. So I think um, build the uh, build inclusive and accessible uh, educational system either in college or in school is uh, the basic needs of us. And then um, raising awareness and capacity building programs to prepare teacher or school or college staff to increase the inclusion in uh, education institutions and then increase uh, the youth with disabilities representation in higher education and institution. So um, I understand that youth with disability uh, has uh, underrepresented a voice uh, or um, the space on, on the uh, educational uh, institution. Which makes the which makes the society thinks that okay, um, with disability, uh, maybe doesn't belong to that school, something like that. So um, we need to increase youth uh, representation. Uh, I mean, youth with disabilities representation more in higher education institutions. And the last one, we really need re a regulation support from the local government, but we understand that we cannot do it alone. We really need a uh, big movement, big organization such as TCI, our uh, Indonesian Mental Health uh, Association to advocate uh, the government 
to make sure that uh, we have more um, inclusive uh, education um, by knowing the challenges of of the youth with disabilities in educational institution and realizing what what we really need, what they really need. Um, hopefully, we as youth with disabilities can see more inclusive education institution in the future. And I hope we hope that we. Uh, with the TCI, with the uh, Indonesian Mental Health Association, can directly engage for more inclusive education in the future. Thank you. Uh, over to you, Wakar. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mazida, for making your submission and, and making all those valid points. Like, uh, we are the underrepresented voice. And as a movement, there is a need that we, as a youth movement, now start working with different stakeholders uh, for making the um, education systems inclusive in our countries. And uh, yes, um, um, there are questions. Sometimes people ask us like, well, what are the accessibility needs of people with psychosocial disabilities? And I think that um, uh, we should uh, also, uh, we will be in touch with you uh, to discuss that as well. And um, yeah, family support, then again, yes, uh, we have been discussing the family support uh, in, in, it was raised in all presentations. And yes, I think the family support is really important um, and um, uh, to support um, uh, uh, the, the young people with like social disabilities for um, having um, access to education, quality education, and then which leads towards the uh, decent employment because without um, um, quality education, a person cannot have access to uh, decent deployment. And we will be listening to uh, Leela Poon uh, in the next presentation about employment and livelihood opportunities. Um, um, as young people with psychosocial disabilities, we have um, no access to livelihood opportunities and employment opportunities, due to which we uh, remain dependent on our family or any other resources. Um, I would request Leela Poon Magar from Koshish, a member organization of TCI in Nepal, um, and share with us um, how we can address this issue and have different, uh, uh, what, 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 what should we do to have decent life as others um, on an equal basis. Um, over to you, Leela. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Walker. Good afternoon and namaste from Nepal. Uh, my name is uh, Leela Poonmagar. I am from Kosis, Nepal. Um, today, I am grateful to be part of this meeting. Uh, thanks, Aton, TCI and Kosis. Um, person with, with a psychosocial disability face more barriers in employment sector. Um, they uh, even can't utilize their basic needs. If we compete for a job with showing our identity, we deprive from interview easily. We have no chance to compete. Employment provider don't believe in our capacity and knowledge. In our Nepal, people thought it as a stigma. More than 20 laws restricts persons with psychosocial disability to get employment. We are not eligible to cast vote and to be a candidate in election. People seek us from the part of medicine only, but not as humanity and social behavior. Rights to education is free for person with disability, but opposite, uh, but it's opposite in implementation. In government job, five person seat is for person with disability, but uh, but we, uh, psychosocial disability, are not engaged there. Um, uh, besides this, we have a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, awareness and consciousness is important. The bitter root of barrier should be uh, thrown away. Uh, the program training should uh, organize for psychosocial program for enhancement our capacity government as well as society and family should encourage us to uh, encourage them to be employed. Uh, advocacy is uh, necessary um, in every sector. 
uh, governments would bring a strong policy about psychosocial disability in our capacity uh, employment uh, providers should uh, um, give a chance in uh, our capacity and knowledge there is also a barrier in our law and policy this needs to be corrected and implemented effectively. Uh, uh, um, I want to share my uh, small uh, experience. Uh, when I was about 16 years old, I used to read and report at English medium school. Um, school did barrier by stopping me read in that school. Um, the principal cast my hand and said not to come again in that school. Uh, today, I think if they gave me chance to read there, I would be another. I would be another Leela. Uh, <laughs> restriction in education in that time is still barrier to me. Uh, so I think quality education should be for every citizen. Um, thus. Uh, let's be together. Thank you. Thank you, Leela, for making that crisp um, intervention and making your submission. Um, and also, thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, what was uh, uh, what happened to you in the school? Um, and uh, yes, identity issues are uh, huge. Um, and and because we are not. Uh, known as persons with disabilities, we are, uh, you know, in countries, we are unable to get all those uh, opportunities which other persons with disabilities um, access and, um, and, and, and we are not uh, given the identification of a person with disability. And uh, yes, there is a need to work with the governments. So with this, um, we'll move to our next speaker. Um, young people with psychosocial disabilities from the LGBTQI community and with non-binary identities remain highly ignored in all aspects of their lives. Um, they are highly discriminated while being part of the community. Um, they face invasive medical and psychiatric treatments and are not given the opportunity to express themselves to explore their identities. I will request uh, Saddam Hanjabam uh, to take the floor uh, from here and share with us about his work in India uh, with the LGBTQI community. Uh, Saddam is the founder of uh, Why All organization, and uh, he is also a curator of Kier Games in uh, Kier Games India and Asia's first all trans men football team. Uh, Saddam, over to you. Uh, thank you, Wakar. And uh, hello, everyone in the panel and uh, other, other people around. So, um, Y'all, definitely, we started as a uh, collective for LG, young LGBTI individuals in, in Manipur, in the northeast part of India. But um, the, the problem which we faced earlier was that uh, in any platforms, uh, LGBTI individuals were not met apart. So what happened was only people from the LGBTI community will gather themselves and will be, you know, um, will be in their own groups, but they were not given space to be in the mainstream. Like this platform is, is such a great platform where uh, TCI has initiated inclusion in true sense uh, with people, including from all, all, you know, not only from the uh, religion region, but also on the base of one's gender and sexual identity. So uh, through Yaol, what we have tried in, in Manipur is that we saw many countries and many uh, cities doing pride walks and pride events for inclusion and awareness for the community. But uh, in certain regions like Manipur, which has been under conflict and crisis for so long, we could not you know, do it like other cities and countries. So somehow we started using sports as a tool to talk about inclusion and awareness and also People from uh, different people from different uh, regions like us, who are, which are in conflict, they generally don't get the uh, you know uh, resources and much needed support. So uh, TCI has provided us uh, with with that kind of a platform in in, in this platform, and uh, you know uh, one biggest challenge for uh, LGBTI individuals everywhere is that. 
uh, they are we, not they, we are not included. Um, and we still face stigma and discrimination just because of our own identity. And when it is uh, incorporated with uh, psychosocial disabilities like me, it becomes another layer of discrimination. And I identify myself as gay and uh, also a person living with psychosocial disabilities and a survivor of drug overdose. So uh, there are multiple layers of discrimination when I come out and speak. And you know, it is difficult for, for people like me, young people like me who live with a, which, which live with a lot of intersections. And definitely we need to talk more about you know, inclusion where uh, it is not limited to the, uh, what do you say, the mainstream, but in the margins mostly. Like we often feel fall under different categories, but somehow um, when, we, when I speak about psychosocial disabilities, sometimes my identity gets lost. So we need to be, uh, you know, um, we need to be talking more about inclusion and definitely about recovery, which I have learned a lot from uh, of how we, inclusion and uh, recovery is a part of journey. And we are in Manipur, we are also trying to uh, work on deinstitutionalization de here for young people living with um, uh, substance use disorder and also people trying to recover from substance use because we are in a border state and definitely there's a lot of crisis around substance use and how people uh, who have used substance or who, who, are, who are dependent on substance are looked from an angle of uh, a criminal. Somehow LGBTI individuals were considered criminal before uh, 2018 in India and it was decriminalized. Homosexuality was decriminalized recently in 2018 and after that, the law has changed, but the people's mindset haven't changed. Similarly, people living with psychosocial disabilities and people who depend on substance are still looked at from an angle of morality and also from the angle of criminal. So they are put behind bars in such a way that uh, in the name of rehab, that uh, they do not recover from it. And we are trying from our side that to break that model of um, you know, rehab and also try to create a space, more space, a safe space for everyone, for young people in Manipur, where we, you know, we provide them that uh, support to come out, speak up. And also, I think uh, one request from my side here is that uh, we are all young people and definitely we need uh, uh, handholding in terms of capacity building and also integrating you know, the community, different communities like, <coughs> sorry, like us from the LGBTI community uh, to be, to be, you know, given knowledge to be, to be handholded by people uh, from PCI and also others. And I, I, I would end by saying thank you again for uh, making us a part of it. And we hope that I would be able to, I not be, not I, but we will be able to give more inputs in making this journey of recovery and inclusion a more diverse one. Thank you. Thank you, Sagam. Uh, thank you so much for making your submission and um, taking out time today for speaking about the LGBTQI community and uh, um, and also uh, most importantly uh, talking about the recovery and uh, recovery uh, which we uh, require at the CRPD-based recovery, uh, which we did uh, at the um, in in our homes in our communities, and which is not available. And um, and thank you for also highlighting the issue of uh, people uh, who are put behind the bars because of the substance use. And uh, um, yeah, so we are uh, running uh, a bit late. And um, thank you, Saddam, for your submission. Um, I will quickly uh, move to the next speaker. Um, as we uh, shared in the beginning that International Disability Alliance is uh, one of the core, uh, a close and strategic partner of TCI. Um, um, establish, they established a youth committee in March, 2021 and co-hosted a full uh, global disability summit for the youth representatives um, in 2022, GDS. Um, TCI and IDA have been working together to host number of 
consultations around the GDS discussion. And I will uh, now like to invite Ms. Amba Salelkar from the IDA. Amba is working in IDA as a capacity building senior technical advisor to the capacity building unit and is one of the lead trainers of Bridge CRPD SDGs training. Um, Amba, over to you. Thanks, I'll keep it short. Uh, thank you very much to all of the speakers. Um, first of all, I mean, I, I am here representing IDA, but I'm also a woman with psychosocial disability. And uh, too recently, I think I was also youth. So a lot of what was said was extremely something that resonated with me. Uh, briefly, Vakar has already um, introduced this, that at IDA, we've always centered the views and experiences of organizations of persons with disabilities in our work, whether it's the advocacy at the UN level or workshops that we organize closer to the grassroots. For those of you who do not know about IDA, it is a global alliance of organizations of persons with disabilities, and we have regional as well as uh, global members. And TCI is a very close partner of IDA from its inception. Um, we are also at IDA very concerned for the participation of, organ of underrepresented groups of persons with disabilities, which many of you also mentioned. And yes, persons with psychosocial disabilities are underrepresented in the disability movement because of the historic marginalization, the issues in identifying people with psychosocial disabilities, the hesitancy to self-identify, the legal barriers and actually organizing themselves. So while OPDs of psychosocial disabilities have actually been founding members of IDA, still the movement as such still remains underrepresented. Um, and uh, we are very happy that in our work on youth with disabilities who are also underrepresented in the disability movement, we've seen the intersection of organizations of persons with psychosocial disabilities and youth leadership. We've seen it very strongly in the work that we have been doing, uh, especially since 2015, where um, we have been specifically looking at the inclusion of youth with disabilities and the inclusion of underrepresented groups in our capacity building initiatives. In 2020, uh, the IDA board and uh, program committee took the decision to include the, realize, the, the rights and the realization of rights of youth with disabilities into IDA's strategic framework, which is from 2020 to 2023. So we started what's called a twin track approach to say that youth with disabilities should be included in all of our activities, but also that there should be specific activities and capacity building for youth with disabilities. And one of the things that we, we did through this is establishing a youth committee, which Wakar mentioned. So all IDA members have a youth representative who is a part of this youth committee. And it's a committee, TCI has also interacted with this committee as well. And this is a committee that is focused on issues relating to youth with disabilities. The youth committee itself was the focal, you could say, uh, um, you know, part of IDA that was working on the Global Disability Summit. And particularly the youth with disabilities had their own platform within this, uh, which was called the, youth, uh, the Global uh, Youth Disability Summit. Uh, and one of the important um, activities which came out from this was a, uh, a youth with disabilities call to action. So the youth with disabilities, the youth GDS was actually co-hosted by the government of Norway and the Atlas Alliance, which is an OPD based in Norway and their member, Young Mental Health, Youth Mental Health Model. And importantly, what I wanted to spend draw your attention to all of the people on this webinar is the youth with disabilities call to action, which was a result of this youth GDS. Now, why this is important is though this applies or it talks about the issues of youth with disabilities, it's co-creation involved or was led by youth with disabilities, including youth from the TCI network who are actually on this call today. And this was launched to a 24 hour webinar, which was hosted in each region 
of the world where youth with disabilities came to talk about their issues. And many issues are very, very similar to the ones which were shared today. There are concerns around um, sexual reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, this issue of participation in culture and sports, issues of LGBTIQ youth with disabilities, and also the entire issue related to health and access to quality health care, including mental health care. So I'm dropping the link to that document in the chat. I would encourage you all to join the network of TCI Youth with Disabilities and also the IDA Global uh, Youth Caucus, which is uh, also something that we will circulate information to. I don't think I can put a message out to everyone, but I'm just, if somebody can, I'm just quoted to hosts and panelists. But if you look up the Global Disability Summit website, you'll find a page on the Youth with Disabilities Network. So thank you very much uh, for all of your sharings and thank you for inviting us as well to be a part of this. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Amba. And uh, um, yes, definitely we will be working in partnership, TCI. Um, International Disability Alliance and IMHA together for the um, uh, for the uh, enhancement of this uh, youth uh, with psychosocial disabilities platform and how together we can um, uh, best uh, build the capacity of youth with psychosocial disabilities as well as how best we can implement the youth call for action. And uh, yes, with this, um, I will say some closing remarks and as I shared earlier like TCI has its presence in more than 44 countries and being a global voice of people with psychosocial disabilities we envision a momentum for effective participation of youth with psychosocial disabilities and through this platform young people with psychosocial disabilities will get the opportunity to be part of the TCI family and um, um, uh, other disability uh, 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 organizations working with different organizations and uh, will be supported with technical assistance, mentorship um, from TCI leadership, as, uh, uh, as well as uh, national nodal, nodal members will be there to uh, support you to build on a common vision for inclusion. Uh, TCI will ensure to make its program participatory of youth with psychosocial disabilities to advocate for inclusion within disability and development through our program instruments, um, as I mentioned earlier, fellowships, country missions, and multi-stakeholder uh, platforms. Uh, we will also call for, uh, open a call for memberships uh, for being part of this uh, youth platform. And also we will include you into our uh, listserv to keep you posted about the uh, works ongoing in TCI uh, related to youth with psychosocial disabilities and also share uh, different opportunities and relevant information where you can uh, contribute. Um, we would advise uh, if you can uh, disseminate the call for membership, it will be out very soon. And, um, 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 and we will disseminate it <clears throat> through the emails as well as um, over the social media platforms. Um, if you have any questions, uh, do write us directly uh, on our emails, um, on our secretariat email, you can write to us and uh, you can visit our website. You can get our contact details from there as well if you have not found it in the chat box. Um, I, I would like to end uh, the webinar here. And uh, before uh, leaving, I would say a thank you uh, to um, all of the speakers who joined us uh, today to mark this International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And uh, my hearty thanks to uh, the interpreters and captionists for supporting us during this webinar. And we look, for, uh, we look forward to meeting you in our next youth webinar. And we will disseminate the information very, very soon. Um, with this, I um, will close uh, the webinar here. And thank you so much. Thank you very much again for joining us. Thank you.